I'll specifically be talking about pro representability of uh, this functor, which is uh, the nth cohomology of the third Milner K, uh, K theory sheaf at uh, kind of the identity of the origin when you consider it as a group. So uh, if at any time you have any questions, please stop me. And you can also see the uh, screen well, I guess, right now, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, for, for this talk, I'm going to have some starting assumptions, which just to, uh, in case I don't say it later, um, are going to be that case of base field. X will typically be a smooth and projective variety. It's always the safest assumption to put on there. And then for variety, I guess I'll mean something that's geometrically integral. Um, so in this case, geometrically connected. And then I'll write uh, CH with the upper I to mean the child group of co-dimension I cycles on X modulo. Um, rational equivalence. And so uh, the starting point of this talk is about representability of uh, child groups, or at least this is where the problem of fair representability of this, these k um groups came from. And uh, in kind of low co-dimension, these groups are uh, known, especially in this case, so, or at least they're easily determinable. So in uh, zero co-dimension, the child group for this variety is just the free billing group generated by X, the second class of X. And in uh, co-dimension one, um, there's a scheme called the Picard scheme of X over K, whose K points give you uh, this child group, um, at least if you assume, for example, that uh, X has a K rational point. And so the next co-dimension is uh, two and the child group of co-dimension two cycles that may not be representable. For a number of reasons. Or in other words, there may not be some uh, scheme over K, which uh, has K points exactly coming from uh, classes of cycles of co-dimension two. And this can hold even under some pretty restrictive um, conditions. So one reason is just That you can find varieties where the uh, restriction from chow two of x to chow two of a uh, algebra of x over an algebraic closure uh, has torsion kernel. Yeah, may I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you mean by representability here? Uh, I mean, for example, that for field extensions, it gives you uh, child groups of field extensions. Uh, yeah, so uh, representable has, I guess you're, you're right. So representable has a lot of different meanings, especially when I'm talking about the child groups, because I wouldn't expect the child groups to be exactly representable on the nose. And so in this case, I would hope at least that maybe chow two of X over field K would be the K points of some um, scheme uh, sitting over K. And that would be compatible with at least change of field. Um, that's the case, at least if X has a rational point uh, in this co-dimension one setting. Yeah. But, uh, you could assume, for example, that uh, in your definition of representability that you only want to know that over an algebraic closure, chow two of X bar is in canonical bijection with uh, the algebraically closed points of some uh, scheme. And, and that may also be uh, not true in, in general, but... Uh, I don't know if that, I'm being a little bit vague in, in this sense. Um, 
for whatever reason. But, uh, does that somehow answer? Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. So uh, regardless of this fact, actually it was proved recently, well in 2019, and then I guess this paper was updated in 2021 by Benoit and Wittenberg, that in some cases you can find uh, a scheme which actually represents in some way this child group of co-dimension two cycles. And so in their um, notation, or in their paper, they prove uh, that if you have a smooth and projective geometrically rational threefold X, then there's some functor, which they call um, chow two of X over K when the FPPF topology, it goes from schemes over K to uh, billion groups. And it satisfies the following properties. So this functor is represented by a smooth group scheme, which they call uh, chow two X over K. And at least over an algebraically closed field, um, there's an isomorphism of the chow group of X over that algebraic closure with the K bar points of this uh, group scheme. And this uh, isomorphism is Galois covariant. So um, you also get a description of at least the Galois invariant elements of the Chow group of co-dimension two cycles as being uh, certain um, points of the scheme over some extensions. And so the motivation that they had to actually construct this uh, scheme was to answer rationality questions for cubic threefolds. And so in particular, uh, I think that they're viewing this uh, Chow group or this representable scheme as um, somehow an analog of the intermediate Jacobian over uh, the inter intermediate Jacobian for this uh, variety over some uh, number field K. And then they uh, use kind of an explicit description of these schemes to get some uh, obstructions to rationality. So if their variety X is actually not just geometrically rational, but rational on the nose, then this uh, Chow scheme that they have is um, a product of Picard uh, schemes of some curves. And so you can kind of expect that something like this might happen um, just because in their setting, so for a, a threefold, if you have two uh, smooth and projective threefolds, say X and Y, then there's this weak factorization theorem, which tells you that you can connect these things by birational morphisms uh, with regular centers. And so at any step, you're just blowing up. So if you have P3 on one side, and then so just the K rational case, rational over the base field, and then your variety X on the other side, um, to go from P3 to X, all you do is blow up at some either points or curves. And every time you do this, you change the group of codimension two cycles by either the Picard scheme of a curve or by some copy of Z. And so uh, the question posed to me by uh, Naranjan Ramachandran was, uh, can this result be generalized in any way? So their construction is actually kind of complicated and it, and it I'll maybe say something about it in a second, but it's also uh, very particular to this one situation. And uh, for some other related reasons, you might expect that um, these Chow schemes actually should be representable by some scheme which is acting like the intermediate Jacobian so long as that inter 
media Jacobian should make sense. And so the class of varieties or the class of threefolds, which are geometrically rational, are not the largest class of these. So you might expect that this could hold true for, for more general varieties. And so the immediate difficulties in answering this question are that uh, you can't directly use Benoit and Wittenberg's functor because it's roughly a sheafified version of this map from Z to the co-dimension two part of a filtration on the Grovnik ring of X, which takes uh, one to the class of some point. They kind of think about this as a co-kernel. And at least for a threefold, you might expect this to be giving you something like the uh, class of sheaves, which are supported in dimension one. And it, it works out like this. But in general, you could try replacing uh, the co-dimension two part by something in co-dimension three or lower. But it gets, it gets kind of complicated. And it kind of relies on knowing how this uh, Grothendieck ring looks and how the filtration should look. Another difficulty is that you can't just immediately use the Chow group functor because, uh, for example, as a functor on, on, on schemes, sending a, a scheme T to the Chow group of co dimension two cycles on the product X times T, uh, that thing is, for one, not a functor on general schemes. Uh, so there's problems with functorality. But also for extensions of fields, this functor can have a kernel. And uh, if you plug into this functor just ex explicitly the spectrum maybe of the ring of dual numbers, that's something that should be telling you uh, more or less the tangent space of your uh, functor. And in, in the case of a child group, that just actually gives you back the uh, child group of the original variety, because the child group doesn't see nil bones. And so uh, to think about trying to generalize this, it was kind of going back to the drawing board and asking what's really going on. And uh, for this, we were looking at uh, actually what happens for the Picard scheme. And so in the case of the child group of co-dimension one cycles, the Picard scheme is actually uh, exactly the functor, which takes a scheme T over K and sends it to the global sections in the FPPF topology of some push forward of uh, this GM sheaf. So here, FT, the projection from the base change, or that you get by base change um, from the structure map from X to, to K. And uh, the most immediate analogy between this functor and something that I can think about is Uh, the relation to, to K theory. So the idea was to try to generalize this in some way or to try to use a variant of the functor, uh, which is roughly sending a scheme T to just uh, think about which side I put this on to just the K cohomology of that uh, scheme XT. And so for a point K, this is really just the K cohomology group of of X, and so that is known to be the child group of co-dimension two cycles by Bloch's formula. And this functor, it, it, it's actually 
not clear whether or not, for example, it sees nil potents. So if I have a, a scheme T, which is just the spectrum of some local Artinian ring, then uh, H2 of Xt with coefficients in this uh, K theory sheaf, it's definitely actually not going to be uh, the same as the Chow group, just giving you back um, the Chow group of codimensional two cycles on X. How much did I take FPPF? Um, in this one, I'm just talking about Zerusky cohomology. Mm -hmm. if, for proving representability, something something has to change in general. Um, because, for example, this will have the same problem with fields if you wanted it to be representable in the same way as the card scheme. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this talk, I, I won't say maybe what kind of generalization one should make going from the K cohomology to try to get a representable function, that's, I think, still a little bit of a mystery to me. But uh, I will talk about kind of a more restrictive notion, which is pro-representability. So this is something that actually, I think, can be answered with K cohomology, just on the notes like that. And so before I say anything really about pro-representability, I want to make this case that uh, Pro-representability is kind of the formal local picture of re representability. And it's a necessary condition for a functor to be representable. It needs to also be re pro-representable at every point. But it's also part of a sufficient criteria for uh, proving representability. And so just to let me, um, just to, show you why it's at least a necessary condition. Condition. Let me suppose uh, that we just have some functor f going from uh, the opposite category of schemes to sets. And I'm going to say that it's representable by scheme y. So on the nose here, just that says f of t is exactly uh, those maps from t to y. And then I want to consider a subcategory of the category of schemes, which has objects, uh, the spectra of uh, local Artinian K algebras with maximum ideal M, having the property that when you quotient by uh, the maximum ideal, you actually just get back the base field K. So the map from K to A has a section, right? projection map. And then the morphisms in the category are just local K algebra maps and those ones induced on the spectrums. And so this is a globally defined representable functor. How do you get a, a local functor from this? Well, you can pick a point E inside uh, just the set of all K points of that functor F, which in the case of a representable functor, it's just the K points of this variety or scheme Y. And then you can define a new functor F sub E as being uh, a functor on that category of Artinian uh, local K algebras or the spectrums of those that takes uh, and input the spectrum of some local Artinian K algebra A and outputs the set of those F inside uh, the globally defined functor F of spec A. So that when you actually compose with the map induced by the projection, you get exactly E inside of uh, F of K. So this is kind of the fiber under the induced map at this point E. So here, pi, it's the map on spectra that's induced by the projection from A to A mod M. And then in the case that uh, F was representable by the scheme Y, the uh, functor F sub E, it's actually representable by the completion of the local ring of Y at E. So there's some explicit formula of this functor on uh, some spectrum of some local Artinian K algebra 
just gives you back exactly those palms from spec A to spec of the completion. So I want to spell that out in kind of a concrete case. We're just looking at the Picard scheme. So this is kind of where a lot of um, the ideas of deformation theory come from. And so if you take the Picard scheme as some variety X over K, and you fix a point T inside the K points of that Picard scheme, then what you're really doing is you're just picking a line bundle L sub t on x. And so in this case, uh, the formal local functor that you'd get from this Picard scheme so you pick x over k comma t on the spectrum of some Martinian ring. It's literally just the set of those line bundles on the product, which I'll write as. Uh, I've been doing this, and I think this is actually kind of common now. But we'll be writing as x sub a. It's those line bundles so that when you uh, reduce modulo m, you actually have just an isomorphism with this uh, chosen line bundle, L sub t. And so in this setting, uh, you can prove pro-representability. It's actually a bit easier than proving representability of the Picard scheme for just this functor. So if you take the functor, which takes uh, line bundles on the product of x times some spectrum of some local Artinian algebra, then uh, and satisfying the property that uh, when you reduce mod m, you back a fixed line bundle L sub t, that functor you can prove is, is pro-representable, uh, much easier than proving that the general Picard scheme is representable. And Arden proved uh, that this is one of the necessary criteria to be representable, but also this along with some other criteria is sufficient to guarantee that uh, the Picard scheme exists as a global moduli functor. And so uh, there's been work by Arden and I think most recently by Reed Hall, along with many others, showing pro-representability plus quite a lot. can be used to prove representability in general. So uh, Arden, for example, proved that the Picard scheme is represented by some algebraic space. And then under some conditions, I think if that algebraic space is finite type over its base, uh, then knowing that it's a algebraic space with values in some in the category groups, then uh, you can actually say that it's represented by a scheme. So uh, there's other criteria for reducing the representability that they get to kind of representable by a genuine scheme. It's a complicated story that really I don't know 100% of the details for. But uh, this is the co-dimension one case still. And so you can ask what happens in co-dimension two. And in 1975, uh, Bloch actually asked this question when he was studying more generally uh, the K cohomology and how it related to algebraic cycles. And so he asked in particular, if you define uh, the functor F sub zero, so superscript n, it's being that functor on uh, a category of Arden local k algebras, uh, 
which associates to an R in local K algebra A, the kernel of the induced map on K cohomology. So this is really kind of picking uh, the zero inside. If N is two, for example, then on the right here, you have the child group of co dimension two. And so it's really picking the identity and looking at uh, the local functor around the identity. And Block showed that that was pro representable. And so here I've been using it. I kind of maybe assume that people know, but K2 in this case is actually just the Zerusi sheaf associated to uh, this assignment. So taking a open U inside of X and sending it to the uh, K2 group of the associated global section ring. And so uh, the precise. Which K2 do you take? I mean, well, not. Uh, was... Okay, yeah. Was that? Was that but since you specify, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and actually, so this is it, this is actually really relevant to Block's uh, proof for pro representability. So Brock Block proved that if you have uh, an algebraic extension of Q, so if K is some algebraic extension of Q, and if you assume that there's some vanishing of the cohomology of X. then uh, this functor is pro-representable and actually the tangent space for this functor, so just the value of the functor on the dual numbers, it's uh, isomorphic to this nth cohomology of the sheaf of Kähler differentials of X. And so this is the same if N is two at least as uh, the tangent space to the functor that was constructed by uh, Benoit and Wittenberg. But but the uh, main obstacle in Bloch's proof is something like uh, Finding another way to view the kernel of this uh, map on uh, the K cohomology. And so, the way that Block proves uh, this result is that he describes this kernel for at least uh, the local setting. So, if you take a local ring R and you take a null potent ideal I in that ring R then there's an exact sequence that is just modding out by R mod I. And then uh, Block defines this group K2 of R comma I as just the kernel of this uh, induced map. And going from uh, this local picture to the, to the K theory sheaf is something that, uh, eventually Block uses to show pro-representability. And in the setting of K2, Block actually uses the fact that these local, uh, K2 of a local ring, it's generated by symbols. And so he defines uh, this, well, he, he looks at this D log map. So, Here, D log going from the K theory of R to the differentials of R over Z. So these are sometimes called the absolute uh, differentials. It's just defined by taking a symbol AB and sending it to the differential of A over A wedge, uh, the differential will be over B. And then considering also the map quotienting out by I, the induced map from the absolute differentials of R to the absolute differentials of R mod I, uh, 
there's a kernel there and a map from this group, which block calls omega r of one mod d of i that connects uh, this group along with the differential in the Duran uh, complex to the kernel of this uh, quotient map from K2 of R to K2 of R mod I. And so here, Block uses explicitly that the kernel of this restriction map on K theory, it's generated by symbols that look like one plus X, where X is some element of I comma Y, where Y is some unit inside of R. And then the map sigma takes something like this and it sends it to the log of one plus X uh, dy over Y. And so once you have the local picture for all these local K algebras R, then you can get a picture uh, chiefified. And after computing some cohomology groups, um, Block proves this statement on pro-representability. And so it wasn't possible from this to extend uh, to the case of higher K cohomology or K cohomology that's not just K2, maybe K3 or K4 or KN. Because in general, those uh, K theories, the KN of R uh, are not generated by symbols. And so this obstruction was actually um, recently fixed by uh, a couple of different people. So, well, let me go back for a second. Let me uh, say that the obstruction to getting a proof for higher uh, K cohomology groups was um, essentially just coming from this fact that the higher K theory is not generated by symbols. And so the obvious uh, way to fix that is to use the Milner K theory sheaf instead. And uh, there was actually an analog of this D log isomorphism um, on the kernel proof for Milner K theory by a couple of different people. And so I want to motivate this result. So let me just say some things about Milner K theory and then I'll kind of give their precise statement in the way that it works. So I'm going to start writing uh, K superscript M to be the Milner K theory of R, in this case, uh, a ring R, as just being the quotient of the tensor algebra of the units of R, tensoring over uh, Z, modulo the ideal generated by those elements that look like X, tensor one minus X, whenever both of those are, are units. And then uh, KMN of R, that's just the degree M homogeneous sum N of this tensor algebra. And so whenever you're given a smooth variety X, you can take this definition and you can chiefify it, taking an open subset U to the Milner K theory, the nth Milner K theory of this uh, ring. And then if you look at a nilpotent extension, so if you take some R in local K algebra A and you take the closed immersion from X to this extension X times A, then the map that you get on Milner K theory sheaves of the reduction map, it has a kernel, which I'm calling KM and rho, and that kernel is actually a direct sum end of uh, this Miller K theory sheaf of the scheme X times A. So it's actually split on the right by the map induced by the projection from XA to X. So you can take a composition from OX to essentially OX and you get back the identity. And so when it comes to uh, computing the uh, cohomology of this kernel sheaf, uh, 
really it's computing exactly the kernel of the map on the cohomology. And so uh, the result that I need in order to generalize Bloch's result is uh, the following. It was proved um, in 2014 by Benjamin Trebus, and then I guess independently by Gorczynski and uh, Tieran in 2018. And I'm giving it in a much more restricted setting than uh, Then they then both of them stated it in, which was surprisingly they have the same statement, but it works in this setting. So if you have a local Q algebra R, if you have some nilpotent ideal I in R, so that the quotient from I, uh, R to R mod I is split, so R mod I sits inside of R, then the kernel of this induce map on Milner K theory, it's isomorphic to uh, some group that you can define in terms of Kähler differentials. So here, the group omega n sub r comma i, it's just the kernel from the induced map of the Kähler differentials, the absolute Kähler differential is going from R to R mod I. And then essentially these groups, they sit inside the usual Durham complex and the differential D, it induces a map from uh, one of the previous ones, omega sub R, R, R comma I to the N minus one. And the quotient there is what uh, they prove is isomorphic to this. Um, kernel of the Milner K theory map. And so in the setting from before, this isomorphism actually sheafifies. Between that kernel that I mentioned before, and two sheaves, which I've been calling uh, R sub rho, and then D of the previous one, R sub rho. And so I thought it was too much notation to write uh, omegas with all of the ideal sheaves and axes. And so here, the way that I define these R's as sheaves. Well, the first one, R, R superscript one sub, sub row, it's exactly the kernel of the induced map on Kähler differentials. And then in general, these higher sheaves, you just take the kernel of the uh, wedge product of this map. So it's a map of Kringer sheaves, and so you can take this wedge product. So this map is kind of gotten canonically by considering the Kähler differentials as the sheaf of uh, universal differentials. But locally, it's essentially just given by uh, reduction as in uh, the case of their theorem, Drew, Gorczynski, and Kieran. And so really a lot of these computations come down to stockwise uh, computations. 
And so this is the theorem that uh, I actually wanted to state today, which is just that uh, a generalization of Bloch's theorem. So it's possible to, to prove the following. Uh, suppose that you have some smooth, proper, and geometrically connected scheme X over K, and assume that K is uh, still an algebraic extension of Q, and then fix some N, which is greater than or equal to one, and suppose that you have the following vanishing on uh, the cohomology of X. So HN of the structure sheaf, HN plus one of the structure sheaf, and HN plus two of the structure sheaf, those shall vanish, along with some vanishing of the cohomology of the higher Kähler differentials. Then uh, there's an isomorphism between the nth cohomology of the sheaf KM three row, and actually just uh, the tensor product of HN of the omega two sheaf tensor with the maximal ideal uh, coming from your art and local K algebra A. So this is a tensor product as a K vector space. And in this setting, so with these two assumptions, one and two, you can actually say that this functor is pro-representable. And so this is a direct generalization of Bloch's result to the case of uh, K3. Really, I think that this should also hold for Kn in general using the Milner K3 sheaf, but I had a little bit of trouble proving one part of the theorem. And so I want to give you some ideas of how it's how it's proved, how the theorem is proved. But first, let me just say that it's a non-trivial statement. So there are examples where the theorem uh, holds. So there are examples in uh, complete intersections. So for example, the theorem holds at least those assumptions on the vanishing of the cohomology. Uh, maybe I should say the theorem applies to it applies to a smooth complete intersection. Uh, two quadrics. Say uh, Q1 and Q2. Inside of P7. So in this case, uh, you can even say that looking at the dimension of the third cohomology of this. And so this is the case of real interest when n was three in the previous theorem. Uh, this dimension is actually just three. It also applies to a cubic fivefold. So the vanishing of some homogeneous polynomial degree three inside P6. Uh, and in that case, the kind of the Hodge number that's interesting, so the one giving the dimension of the Chow group in some sense, actually has uh, dimension 21. And so both of these examples are uh, coming from some table that was computed by uh, Rappaport in uh, the appendix of uh, article by Deline. Um, and they're not the only examples where the theorem applies. So more recently, I, I think I found that the theorem applies to what's called a Gushel-Makai bifold. Uh, 
The table that you refer to is some computation of uh, Hodge numbers. Where yeah, it it's a competition. I mean, it's a description of all. So it's a classification of all uh, complete intersections inside projective space that have, uh, I guess, Hodge level one or something like this. And so it's those ones that have Hodge diamond that are kind of concentrated in the center with maybe mm -hmm. one offshoot. Mm -hmm. And so Rappaport uh, computes that there's really just a finite list of those varieties that have this Hodge diamond, and then he computes the Hodge numbers in the, the, the middle degrees for these varieties also. So I don't know much about Kushal and Kai five folds, but I could find their Hodge diamond. And so in this case, uh, the relevant Hodge number, it's actually got dimension 10, I, th I think. So. And just to check this dimension that you say is, uh, should be the dimension of the varieties that represents. Chelsea, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. If, if that exists. Yeah, it should be the dimension of the variety that would be the connected component of the identity. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, it's true also that um, with the vanishing assumptions that I stated, if you extend scalars to C, then there's these intermediate Jacobians on the tangent space of the intermediate Jacobian is the same vector space as the tangent space that I gave for this representable functor. And so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the, the proof. But not a whole, whole ton, so I'll say that this is a proof sketch. And uh, the proof is actually relatively simple. In terms of for representability, there's this nice theorem of Schlesinger that gives you a, a list of criteria that are both necessary and sufficient to prove for representability of, of a functor on this category of, say, spectrums of our Tinian local k algebras. And so by Schlesinger's criterion, Let's say it's actually uh, enough to show uh, that there's an isomorphism just among these two groups. More specifically, Schlesinger's criterion, it says that if you have this functor, now I'm going to write it as on the opposite category of the opposite category that I had before. So really just the category of local Artinian K algebras, not taking the spectrum. Then that functor is per representable if and only if uh, it satisfies the following conditions. So there's quite a few of them. But essentially, uh, when you evaluate at the at the uh, local Artinian k algebra, just given by k itself, you should get one point. The cardinality of that set should just be one. And so, in our case, um, the maximal ideal there is zero. And so, tensoring with zero, we just get zero. And so that condition is satisfied. Under this isomorphism. Um, there's a condition here, H1, which looks kind of confusing, but it's just saying that this functor 
uh, at least on fiber products should be surjective. And so you can get that just from this isomorphism and how it's uh, induced. So if you take the maximal ideal of a fiber product under really just some specific uh, or in local K algebra is A prime and A prime prime, then this isomorphism, uh, you can check that the vector space tensor, the maximal ideal actually does subject onto essentially the fiber products of those maximal ideals tensor the vector space. Um, this condition H2, it's another one of those things that follows directly from the isomorphism using the fact that, well, if you plug in the dual numbers for one of your R and local K algebras, then the maximal ideal is just one dimensional. The one condition which is not immediately obvious in general, but it's obvious in the situation that we're in is the fact that the tangent space of the functor should have finite dimension. So if there's a variety that's essentially representing it, then you expect that it has finite dimension. And in this case, finite dimensional dimensionality follows from the fact that HN of this cohomology group, since X is, X is going to be projective, or it has finite dimension. And then there's one more condition which says roughly that some fibers of this functor are torsor under the tangent space, which you can restate as saying that in uh, some restricted surjections from these are in local K algebras, this F actually is an isomorphism or it commutes with the fiber products in general, but it's just some condition that can be checked. And so really the problem comes down to or showing in some way that these two things are isomorphic these two um, groups. And so to do that, uh, I use this theorem of Trudis and uh, korchinsky tieren But in this higher dimensional setting, you need to somehow relate these things. So the way that I do it is that uh, you first write just the sheaf of Kähler differentials on the product of XA as being a direct sum of the two sheaves of Kähler differentials. And so to see that this should be true in general is you can think about uh, the dual. So if you have the tangent space of a product X times Y for arbitrary varieties X and Y, then that would be the direct sum of the tangent space of X and the tangent space of Y. And dualizing, you just get the direct sum of omega 1x and omega 1a. And then if you take nth wedge powers of this direct sum decomposition for this sheaf of Kähler differentials, then actually you get an isomorphism of the nth sheaf of Kähler differentials of xa, and this null potent extension of x, and a this direct sum of sheaves of Kähler differentials of x and uh, tensor product with this sheaf of Kähler differentials of A over K. Well, this thing on the right is actually just K vector space. And so this makes it a lot more manageable, at least to try to compute cohomology of these things, realizing that with some vanishing assumptions, you can maybe get a hold on the cohomology of the, these omega J's of X. And then for R and local K algebras, maybe you can say something about these uh, vector spaces. So for example, if you take uh, the sheaf, which I was calling Rn uh, rho, it includes naturally into this um, nth wedge power of, uh, of Kähler differentials on Xa. And under this isomorphism, it's a direct sum. If you further project, 
down to just one sum and. So if I get rid of uh, the sum and where j is n, and so here omega zero goes away, and then uh, omega uh, n is kind of the thing that you'd be interested in, should somehow come from the kernel. So if you project down to this sum end, then the kernel is actually just the maximal ideal of the uh, art local k algebra A tensor with the uh, nth Kähler differential sheaf of, or the nth wedge power of the Kähler differential sheaf of x. And then the differential on uh, these sheaves are rho, they, they actually induce some short of sequence looking at this composition. So this is kind of glossing over a few details, but they induce some short exact sequence, which uh, looks like, so, G superscript n, I'll just call call that first sheaf. It's a quotient of the kernel by some other thing. And then in the center uh, is the sheaf that is computing the kernel of the Milner K theory sheaves. And then some sheaf Cn rho, which you can explicitly determine. And so here, uh, Ma prime, this is what I'm writing for the kernel of the differential induced on the Durand complex for A. So going from the maximum ideal of A to omega one. And then in the case, for example, N equals two, this co-kernel sheaf you can write out, it's essentially determined by, I'm gonna go back for a second. It's essentially determined by this sum and then quotient by some map on the differentials. And so the rest of the proof, it's actually devoted to showing that the cohomology of this sheaf C2 row vanishes, and then you compute explicitly the cohomology of the sheaf Gn and, and show that it's actually just isomorphic to some cohomology of omega n, at least in the case n equals two. In general, you can always say what this sheaf co-kernel Cn row is. And, uh, the challenging part really is showing that the cohomology of that sheaf vanishes. And so a lot of the proof is just devoted to showing that the cohomology of this sheaf Cn rho is zero when n equals two. In general, I can pretty much always say that the cohomology of Gn in this sheaf is isomorphic to, with some vanishing on the cohomology of Ox and omega, some powers of omega. Uh, that the sheaf here has isomorphic, isomorphic cohomology to just some cohomology of the nth wedge power of x. So I actually included um, the explicit statements of the lemmas that I would need to compute these two things. But let me just give you an example. Uh, for an explicit art in local K algebra that shows why these two kernel and co-kernel are giving you what I said before. So this is the case where we take the art in local K algebra just to be the ring of dual numbers, K join epsilon mod epsilon squared. And in that case, um, The map that goes from the maximal ideal of this Lauren logo K algebra, it's just the one dimensional ideal E, and it goes to the uh, K differentials of this A. Uh, that's an isomorphism. So, uh, this is the map D. That's actually not too bad to check. Um, it comes from describing the Kähler differentials of this R and local K algebra uh, using some presentation, but it turns out that's a nice morphism. And 
that means that the kernel is trivial of that differential map D. And in general, for the higher wedge powers, uh, since this is a one dimensional vector space, you get, for example, that omega two is actually just zero also. And so now GN, if you were going to look at it, since MA prime is uh, zero, you get that GN is just omega N of X over K since you're this maximal ideal, which is one dimensional. And uh, maybe I'll say G2. But it works more generally. And then C2, uh, the omega 2 goes away. And so really, this is just omega 1 x over k plus times omega 1 a over k. And then modulo sum, uh, sum of two differentials. But d of ma, that's just omega. 1. And so actually, this is the quotient by something which, well, this subgroup is contained inside omega 1 x over k times omega 1 a over k. And this thing is all of that thing. And so actually, OK, granted that I swapped the order here. Uh, this quotient is just actually 0. And so when you compute the cohomology of this short exact sequence, the cohomology of this C2 sheaf of rho, it all vanishes. The cohomology of G, it just becomes the cohomology of uh, omega 2, tensor the maximum ideal MA. And then uh, the cohomology of the middle thing here is the cohomology of the kernel of that Milner K theory sheaf sequence. So, so you get exactly uh, the result in this case. But really for any j, uh, hj of x km three rho, it's isomorphic to hj x omega two x over k tensor with the maximum ideal. In this one particular example. So this is more or less me copying down that last state model. Any questions? Thanks. Um, I have uh, I've got more, but any questions about this so far? <laughs> okay. Yeah, just a small question. Mm. Am I right that you use these assumptions on the Hodge numbers? Uh, to, to see when you think of homology of that CN, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it, it gets used in both actually computing uh, the cohomology of the GN and the cohomology of the CN. So let me give you the two explicit statements. Mm -hmm. So the first one holds actually for higher Milner K theory sheaves also. And it's the following. So this is the first lemma that I use. And it's let's suppose that X is some smooth proper geometrically connected variety. And I have two integers n and j. And then if I know the vanishing of some kind of lines of the Hodge diamond, then actually I can just tell you for any art and local k algebra maximal ideal MA, uh, the nth cohomology of GN, it's actually just isomorphic to this nth cohomology of the omega J. And so this holds, or at least this is the more general one. 
the part that I have trouble with is generalizing the computation of cohomology for the CN chief. And so that relies on this lemma, which is that uh, suppose you have some geometrically integral variety X and suppose that you have some fixed integer N then if you know that the these four cohomology groups are all zero, then you actually know that the nth cohomology of the C2 sheaf is actually zero itself. And so combining the two, uh, gives the main theorem. For these groups. So whenever you know all of these vanishing of the cohomologies, the first lemma having actually quite a bit of vanishing, but not so much if you just look at the specific case that uh, uh, of the third Milner K theory sheaf, then um, you can get this per representability result. But really the difficulty comes down to computing the vanishing of this CN sheaf. Uh, 